168 years after Frederick Douglass delivered his iconic address, the meaning of July 4th for the Negro, the William Monroe Trotter Collaborative for Social Justice at the Center for Public Leadership gathered together members of the Harvard community. Today, those community members invoke the prophetic words of Frederick Douglass in this American moment of pain, protest, and the fight for freedom. Hear the words of our forebear, our forefather, Frederick Douglass. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This to you is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your mind back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance and to the signs and the wonders associated with that act and that day. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I'm glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young, 76 years, though a good old age for a man is but a mere speck in the life of a nation. Three score years and 10 is the allotted time for individual men, but nations number their years by the thousands. According to this fact, you are even now only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I'm glad that this is so. There is hope in the thought and hope is much needed. Under the dark clouds which lower upon the horizon, the eye of the reformer is met with angry flashes portending disastrous times, but his heart may well be lighter at the thought that America is young and that she is still in the impressible stage of her existence fellow citizens. Pardon me. Allow me to ask why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence of the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? I am not included within the pale of glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in feathers into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems or inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. 
Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct. And let me warn you that it is dangerous to copy the example of a nation whose crimes, towering up to heaven, were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, burying that nation in irrevocable ruin. I can today take up the plaintive lament of a peeled and woe-smitten people. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions, whose chains, heavy and grievous, yesterday are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children who sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth to forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with a popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day in its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view, standing there identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine. I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and the conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is feathered, and in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can command everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word will escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men? Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice, hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans dividing and subdividing a discourse 
to show that men have a natural right to freedom? Speak of it relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively? To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employment for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine, that God did not establish it, that our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? They that can may, I cannot. The time for such argument is past. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation. And you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Behold, the practical operation of this internal slave trade, the American slave trade, sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what is a swine drover? I will show you a man drover. They inhabit all our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. You will see one of these human flesh jobbers armed with pistol and whip and bowie knife driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave market at New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along and the inhuman wretch who drives them. Hear his savage yells and his blood-chilling oaths as he hurries on his affrightened captives. I was born amid such sights and scenes. To me, the American slave trade is a terrible reality. When a child, my soul was often pierced with the sense of its horrors. 
the fate of many a slave has depended on the turn of a single card. And many a child has been snatched from the arms of its mother by a bargain arranged in a state of brutal drunkenness. The fact that the church of our country, with fractional exceptions, does not esteem the fugitive slave law as a declaration of war against religious liberty implies that the church regards religion simply as a form of worship, an empty ceremony, and not a vital principle requiring active benevolence, justice, love, and goodwill towards humanity. It esteems sacrifice above mercy, psalm singing above right doing, solemn meetings above practical righteousness, a worship that can be conducted by persons who refuse to give shelter to the houseless, to give bread to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and who enjoin obedience to a law forbidding these acts of mercy is a curse, not a blessing to mankind. But the church of this country is not only indifferent to the wrongs of done to the slave, it actually takes sides with the oppressors. It has made itself the bulwark of American slavery in the shield of American slave hunters. Many of its own eloquent divines who stand at, as its very lights of the church have shamelessly given the sanction of religion and the Bible to the whole slave system. They have taught that man may properly be a slave, that the relation of master and slave is ordained by God, that to send back an escaped bondman to his master is clearly the duty of all the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this horrible blasphemy is palmed off upon the world for Christianity. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened and the doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began with hope while drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions. My spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did years ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time was when such could be done. God, speed the hour, the glorious hour, when none on earth shall exercise lordly power, nor in tyrant's presence cower, but all to manhood's stature tower by equal birth. That hour will come to each to all, and from his prison house the thrall go forth. Until that year, day, hour arrive with head and heart and hand out strive to break the rod and rend the jive, the spoiler of his prey deprived. So witness heaven, and never from chosen post would e'er the peril or the cost be driven.